guy. He had an, um, an, uh, a career that spent more than four decades in international diplomacy. And he was called upon many times by the foreign ministry for, let's say, the touchy subjects. For example, when Muammar Gaddafi, the former dictator of Libya, captured and took hostage three uh, soldiers from the Netherlands, the question was, who are we going to call to negotiate their release? The obvious answer, our ambassador to Greece, Mr. Kees van Rij. When Jair Bolsonaro was elected as president of Brazil, and many people wondered, well, who is going to talk to the Brazilians now? The obvious answer in The Hague was Mr. Kees van Rij. And when Greece, the society as we know it, was imploding around 2008 during the Euro crisis, there was only one man fit for the job as ambassador, Mr. Kees van Rij. Today, we'll be asking him what he learned during his ambassadorships in Greece, Spain, Turkey, and Brazil, what he took away from negotiating with the likes of Putin, and how he managed being blocked from his ambassadorship in Turkey. We're very happy to have him here today and to get an insight into the mysterious world of diplomacy. So let's give a big round of applause to our guest, Mr. Kees van Rij. Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. Take, please take a seat. So. So, you're back at your uh, alma mater, as they say. Um, you studied at UFA. Could you tell us uh, what you studied here? I studied history. Okay. And, and did you... more specifically, 19th century French history. Okay. And, and did you already know back then that you wanted to become a diplomat? I didn't know that. I was actually so fascinated by, in particular, the... The July monarchy in France between 1830 and 1848, that I thought maybe I should uh, prepare for a PhD in this uh, okay. yeah. area. And uh, I was sort of looking forward to a more scientific career. But then I found out that I had other talents. Uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, so I finished my, my studies. I, uh, among other people, I studied with Professor Brons, Martin Brons, who um, was a very prominent uh, historic uh, professor in, uh, in modern history in the university here. He, uh, he, he passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, then I, uh, I decided to, uh, to opt for diplomacy. Yes. And your first posting was to South Korea, and at the time, South Korea was not a democracy, so to say. It certainly so wasn't. It was even a dictatorship, yes. eh? a authoritarian regime. So how old were you at the time? Um, I must have been 29. 29. 29, 30. I was so so you, you were flown out to the other side of the world. <laughs> you land in this dictatorship. Yeah. Did you ever doubt your choice while you were there? That you were like, what am I doing here? No, because... Korea in those days was a very fast developing um, economic um, wonder. Mm. Uh, it was going very fast um, and we were seeing double digit growth uh, numbers. We had a lot of Dutch companies investing and doing trade with Korea yep. in those days. And uh, I was in the economic and commercial department of the Netherlands embassy there. Uh, so we had one delegation after the other, all trying to link up with the Korean uh, business world and also with the government, obviously. And um, this was a fascinating period. This was before the Olympic Games of 1988. Yeah. It was a very different country, very protectionist country. And slowly, uh, because it developed a sort of created a middle class was yeah, coming yeah, into yeah, existence. Yeah. Before that, it didn't really exist. And we, we saw... Uh, the change and you know when when people are having a, a better situation for their daily life and be, start to go up into the middle yeah. class uh, they uh, they don't want to live in a, in a dictatorship anymore so yeah, it's, it's not only the students who went into the streets but also their parents and when that happens you know that something is really going to change and yes, it did South Korea is not the only hotspot you were posted in. Yeah. So we heard earlier you were posted in one hotspot after another. 
But we can make a second observation. Um, a lot of the countries you were involved in have since deteriorated. For example, the war in Ukraine, uh, the situation in Turkey under Erdogan, um, the situation in Afghanistan. How do you feel about that? Well, it's, first of all, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that would be uh, uh, not, uh, not very good analysis. No, it's, um, uh, it's a question of um, how things developed. Uh, in some cases, it went for the better. So Korea went for the better, it became a democracy, and now it's part of the, let's say, advanced democratic uh, uh, countries. Um, Peru, uh, where I was also stationed, was in a very bad situation when I was there with the uh, Shining Pass terrorist movement, with a lot of corruption problems, but it's doing much better now uh, after many years. And so uh, Turkey is, um, is a complicated case. Turkey is a democracy. It's under pressure. It has, um, I would say, autocratic tendencies, but it's still a democracy. And, you know, um, I've learned that whatever the character or the nature of a, of a government is, of a society is, the geography, you can never change geography. Mm. So Turkey is positions where it's positions. So whatever the situation in Turkey is, we will always have to deal with them. We always have to, um, to talk to them, to solve problems, because we have s so much in common. Mm. We have a... Um, uh, geographically located, they command the, the entry to the, to the Black Sea, they're an important regional player in the Middle East, mm. and they are also a European country, by definition. And uh, so, very complicated, we do not always agree, but we continue to talk and to deal with, uh, with um, uh, Turkey and the Turkish government. Do you have one diplomatic effort that you were involved in that you're most proud of? Um, well, actually, uh, yes, um, and it's not a, a, a big thing in terms of uh, a geopolitical accomplishment. I can tell you a lot about that too, about uh, Ukraine, Moldova, um, and other negotiations. But I'm very proud of one specific consular case. You know, the work of uh, di diplomats is not always being little Kissingers. It's, yeah. very, it's very often... Uh, solving complicated issues that have to deal, that are dealing with, with uh, Dutch citizens who are in trouble in another country. Um, and there was a case um, in uh, 2016, uh, in the spring, during the Dutch EU presidency where we were negotiating the famous Turkey deal. Uh, about uh, the immigrants and about immigrants uh, and the war in Syria and how could we deal with uh, the government of Turkey to um, uh, to find a balance there and an agreement to um, to solve some of those uh, migratory uh, mi uh, migration pressures yeah. and in that crisis in that negotiation all of a sudden a Dutch citizen Mrs. Uh, Ebru Umar Dutch journalist with Turkish roots was um, lifted from her bed in the middle of the night by the police, put in prison, and um, because uh, in the social media she had certain, made certain remarks, not very positive remarks about the president of Turkey. And uh, so, because she was rather well known, there was a lot of pressure, can we do something to, to get her out of that? And uh, well, one of them. Maybe out of interest, because we all read about that in the news the next day. Yep. What is the moment you get informed as ambassador? Okay, uh, well, immediately. Citizens, immediately. immediately on, the on, police on, calls. On, uh, on a Saturday night at one o'clock in the morning, I was okay. in deep sleep, and I got this call. This uh, lady is in, in prison. Can, can you help? So I've, I found her a lawyer within the hour at that time of the night. But, but, but maybe you, you get that call. Huh? So yeah. we have taken in captivity a Dutch citizen. Yeah. What is your first thought? My first thought is, uh, what can we do to, to make sure that the rule of law is followed? Right? Because I, in a way, I cannot intervene in, in, in the justice system in Turkey. We don't want others to uh, mingle in our justice system either. Mm. So you are going in a balance. It, it's a complicated balance. 
But what I could do is to, give, to get a lawyer to her. Because, Which you did in be, an hour. Because everybody is entitled to have a lawyer. But, uh, okay, so the lawyer got her out of prison within uh, 48 hours, something like to 72 hours, and but then she had to give her passport and she was not allowed to leave the country until a uh, trial would take place. Well, that can take a long time. So uh, within a number of days, the pressure was mounting. Uh, what can we do? What can we do? And then I said, well, I can go and see a person very near to the president and uh, try to to talk to him to see if we can solve this issue. Who, who, who was this person? Well, this was the, uh, the head of the private office of the president. And how, how do you know the head of the I, private office I, of the president? I knew him because rule number one of any ambassador who takes his position in the country in question yeah. is to build a network. Okay. So the first six months, first year, I went to see everybody that I could see that had even a remote interest for me as a Dutch ambassador, and particular in situations where you don't have any favors to ask, just to know them. And then when you know a person, you can call him if there is a problem. Mm. So this is rule number one of any ambassador is get a network. And this person, I knew him uh, from my network, and he knew me. So I had easy access to him, and I explained the situation, and um, I said, uh, you know, we are um, in a situ complicated situation, is it not possible that sh she travels back to the Netherlands, you lift her travel ban, give her back her passport, and then she'll wait until there is a trial one day in, in Turkey, and she'll come back. We don't know if she would do that, but at did least... It, did you guarantee that? No, I could, can give no guarantees. So you said she might return? I said, uh, you know, can she wait? Can she wait for her trial in the Netherlands? That's all I asked. But he, he must have thought this is the uh, loosest of commitments. No, 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 because at the same time, uh, he knew, and sometimes uh, that's the advantage when you are in a situation where you also have something what we would call leverage. We were negotiating this complicated Turkey deal. There was a lot of money involved and uh, enormous political uh, challenges. Mm. Uh, very important for Turkey, very important for the European Union. And we happened to be in the, um, in the chair at that yeah, moment. Yeah. So I was communicating with our prime minister, with our foreign minister, with Brussels, EU. So very complicated situation. So I said, you know, if, uh, if we are not, uh, if, if this issue is not solved, this will definitely not be good for the position of my government defending the deal in our parliament, diminishing the, uh, the room for maneuver. Mm. So please, can you not help? And that convinced him, and uh, he made sure that uh, the travel ban was lifted. But, but because if you say that to me, then I may, my, uh, might also think this is a veiled uh, threat, huh? that, no. that if I don't do this, then the negotiations will be, uh, no. I don't know. Uh, no, no, no. You always formulate it in such a way that the person you talk to can do this in an honorable way, yeah. and that the person in question also doesn't lose face. Okay. Not losing face. Uh, so it's a so that's, that's lesson number two. Well, that's a Network, that's no, number, not lose face. There's a number of lessons. And uh, you have to be very careful because if you, pu if you push somebody in a corner and you win, the next time you will have an enemy. Mm. So you don't want to have enemies. So even with people who are complicated or regimes that are complicated, you always have to create a situation, even in very difficult situations, where there is an exit. Mm. Uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the most important uh, lessons in diplomacy. Always leave a, a way out. So maybe we In diplomacy, can... I'm not saying in situations of war, this is a different story, but in diplomacy, you should always leave some room for finding an exit and not losing face. So maybe we can see if finding an exit was important in this next situation we want to look at. Uh, in a recent interview you did with the Volksgrant um, earlier this year, you talk about negotiations you were involved with with Putin in the early 2000s. Um, can you first tell us a little bit about what your role was there? Well, I was a diplomatic advisor to the then High Representative for Foreign and Security Affairs of the European Union, the first one, uh, Javier Solana, mm -hmm. a Spanish former foreign minister and a former Secretary General of NATO. And this was around 1999, 2000? Uh, he and I joined 
this unit in uh, this job in uh, in Brussels in uh, late 1999, mm -hmm. and I stayed with him until the summer of 2005, and then I returned to The Hague. Uh, in that period, we uh, we were um, seeing the uh, uh, the developments in Russia and uh, the election of uh, Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. First he was prime minister and then later elevated to the presidency. So we, I'm I, accompanying my political boss, I met him about two, three times a year for five and a half years, or five years almost, yeah. Wow, okay, so can you tell us a little bit what the initial negotiations were about? There were a few of them that you speak of in the interview. Well, um, those were days that, uh, after the Soviet Union had disappeared and uh, dissolved in uh, a number of countries, like Ukraine, uh, Belarus, uh, Russia, other countries, Moldova, um, we were um, in a situation where we, ne we negotiated in the framework of what we call uh, the European Neighborhood Policy, mm -hmm. that was what it was called, um, a uh, comprehensive strategic uh, cooperation agreement with, with Russia. And we basically uh, focused on four areas, political issues, economic issues, um, people to people, and scientific uh, kinds of exchanges, universities, for instance. And uh, so we negotiated that framework. Um, at the same time, in that period, uh, we negotiated the accession of uh, 10 uh, Central and Eastern European countries to join the European Union. Including? Which, uh, happened in 2004, like Poland, the Baltic countries, uh, the Czech Republic, Slovak, and so on. You also had some negotiations about Ukraine, correct? Yeah. Moldova and Ukraine. Um, considering the current war in Ukraine, I think what would be very interesting for our audience is to hear about your experience in those negotiations with Putin and what you think, if, if there's anything we're missing um, as we are analyzing the war today? Well, those were days that we were on speaking terms with uh, President Putin and his uh, advisors, ministers. Uh, so there was a, uh, an open dialogue, not always easy, uh, but there was an open dialogue. And I recall vividly that, uh, for instance, when uh, in the fall of 2004, there were elections in Ukraine. Uh, President Kuchma was going to withdraw, and there were two candidates who um, were running for presidency. And uh, during those elections, um, it appeared more and more they were completely falsified in favor of the pro-Russian candidate Yanukovych. And Yushchenko was the pro-Western candidate. But it was very, very clear also through the observers of the OSCE, they had observers and the Council of Europe and other observers, that um, a lot of wrong things had happened in counting votes. So uh, we, uh, we, we then, as a European Union, we, uh, uh, we answered the call of President Kuchma to help out. Uh, very interesting, the President of Ukraine asked us to help solve this issue. So, we negotiated with the uh, European Union, we negotiated at the round table, uh, but my boss, Mr. Solana, said this makes only sense if we are sure that there is also a prominent uh, Russian delegate at the table, because if we come to an outcome and the Russians are not involved, this will be the, the, the origin of a new problem later on. Mm. And indeed, the president of Russia decided to send the president of the Duma, their parliament, who was in the negotiations and who signed also the agreement that, was, that is new, uh, new election, and then eventually the, the pro-Western candidate Yushchenko won. Um, so those were days we could still talk to him. He didn't like it very much, because obviously for all kinds of reasons we know wrong or right, but uh, Russia sees Ukraine as, as a part of its own history. Um, and that was also sens sensible and was also visible in that period. Do but at least examples? we were able to talk, we were able to negotiate. Do you, do you have any examples where those goals were, and also the vision that Ukraine is a part of Russia, that was visible already back then? Well, not, it was not very, 
visible by the official uh, people, but when you study like, the, the, the papers of historians or of more uh, people in the scientific community, universities, there was always this narrative that uh, the, the history of Russia started in Kiev and uh, things like that. But it was not that pronounced. And your memories behind closed doors, your conversations with those representatives, um, did you? Well, that was tough, very tough. I recall. Why? I, sorry? Why was it tough? It was very tough. Um, I rec because we also, during that negotiation, which was not well known, this, this revolution, the Orange Revolution in those days, 2004, it's a little bit forgotten now, but it's, it was a very important change. Um, well, I, I recall one specific um, instance. We had a complicated situation. You had two candidates, one pro-Western, one pro-Russian. And in both camps, you also had uh, extremists, people who were prepared to go much further than finding a compromise. And in the camp of the pro-Western candidate, there was a group of people who basically wanted to force the issue. And they did that, among other things, during the negotiations we held, by blocking the entrance of a number of key ministries on the Maidan Square, particular energy and internal affairs, interior affairs, two essential ministries for public order and for, of course, yeah. obviously also uh, energy issues. But I can see how that uh, irritated the Russians. Well, that irritated the Russians, it irritated the extremists uh, on the other side, mm. so that could have developed into a clash of, uh, of armed, uh, armed people. So I recall that when we saw that happening, that I, um, I was in touch with one of the people who were spokesmen or had access to the extreme people on the pro-Western candidate, and I said, you know, if you block those doors and you force people to intervene to open these doors, there will be a bloodbath. Mm. And this is not the way to come to a compromise, and certainly not a way to build on a long-term relationship with the European Union. So please call these people to order. Um, and obviously also on the other side, we also had to, to play on, mm. uh, no, take away. So you had two candidates, they didn't like each other, but at least they were talking. So we convinced the extremists on both sides to, uh, to, 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 well, to, to uh, not to make a negotiation impossible. Yeah. And, that, and that worked. Did you lock eyes with Putin? Oh yes, several times. Wh wh what is that like? <laughs> Funny, um, I recall that the first time I was uh, accompanying my boss, Mr. Solana, we were there with the European Union delegation in the spring of 2000. So he had been in, in that position for a very short time. And we negotiated, um, you know, at a table with two sides. I, yeah. was, I was on the edge, I took notes. And uh, I, uh, I recall that, uh, you know, about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning, you have a break. Like we all, you know, we have, we have a, a meeting and you have a break for coffee. So mm -hmm. I, I was stepping with my other colleague diplomat a little bit to the side to take a cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, uh, the president uh, walks to us and asks us in, in German, perfect German, whether this was the first time we were in the Kremlin. So he said, yes, and it's very impressive because it's a beautiful building. And he said, yes, very nice to have you here. And then, you know, sort of easy going. And uh, also I recall that in the first uh, negotiation we had, he, he took, of course, the floor. He had an enormous command of the big issues, but also the details. So he, has, he, has, he was a, a good, um, uh, you know, the content uh, and his political analysis was, uh, from their point of view, was actually quite professional. And, uh, but he also gave the floor to others at the table on their side, which um, it was not, we were not accustomed to. We were always accustomed that one person would take the floor on the Russian side and we divide the role, the speaking roles on our side, because the European Union is a more, let's say, a diffuse uh, organization. So that was, those were a few things that I recall, yes. Did you ever think this man is evil? Um, no, but we were not naive. We knew that, of course, um, he was uh, also dreaming in a way of uh, reconstituting um, what had been the Russia, Russian imperial tradition, 19th century imperial tradition, because he had also mentioned that. But we didn't see uh, immediate reasons to fear that he would take action in that direction. That came much later. Yeah. Actually, 
only after 2007, and then it was already gone. So at, in those early years, that was still not the case. But we were not naive. We, we knew this was uh, a complex uh, country with a lot of corruption, uh, oligarchs taking over assets that were you know, dealt with in a very strange way. So we were not naive, but you know, we had not foreseen that uh, he would uh, use force like he's doing now. Because he did, yeah. I think uh, none, none of us did, so to say. None of us did. Yeah. Um, then you uh, were at some point, I think, uh, uh, also negotiating about uh, Transnistria. Uh, that's a difficult region uh, to negotiate about, a lot of uh, sensibilities there. Um, but what we are most interested in is that you, uh, y yeah, we, that you then experienced how Russian diplomats sometimes try to use certain techniques to get their way. Yeah? So could you maybe explain, because w without uh, uh, maybe explaining the whole Transnistria deal, um, what kind of techniques did they use in, in that case, uh, to get their way. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, they sometimes say that uh, Russian diplomats are chess players. And, and they are. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're very, very smart. That doesn't mean they always get, get their way, you know, get, uh, get it their, the way they wanted it, but they are, they're good chess players. So what happened in 2003 was we were dealing with this very complex issue of Moldova. Probably have to look on the map where it is, but it's Moldova. It's a former Soviet Republic that became independent. Uh, it has a, uh, well, the language they speak is Moldovan, but actually that is a, it's, it's a, a, a Romanian. And a very small part on the other side of the river Dniester is called Transnistria, the other side of the Dniester, which is where there's a large Russian speaking uh, group. Mm. And for years we, uh, we were supporting negotiations that the two parts could be re reunited, that Transnistria could be part of a, uh, a Moldovan state. Like uh, also for, for many years, we support the negotiations between uh, uh, Cyprus, the two parts of Cyprus to be reunited. Very mm. difficult. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's not get into that. No. Well, you but, know, uh, enough geography but what for we, now. What we wanted before countries like Romania and Bulgaria were going to join the European Union a mm. number of years later, what can we do to, to ease things a little bit in that area? So we, we negotiated to number, so we, you have this format of the uh, five, five countries. The OSCE, which is chairing those meetings, OECE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They have the seat uh, seated in, uh, in Vienna. It's an international uh, country, all European countries mm. in North America are member there. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Transnistria, and uh, Moldova the five. And the United States and the European Union were uh, the plus two, which basically we were uh, supporting the negotiations. Because finding a solution is one thing, and the other thing you also need to have the security issues and the economic issues. And there, of course, the United States and the European Union had a role to play. So we had these negotiations in this five plus two format. Then, at one stage, you recall that uh, the uh, the government of Georgia was toppled, and uh, Sh uh, Shakashvili uh, was a new candidate who basically um, uh, took, over. Uh, took over and, and uh, sent away Chevranadze, who was the then president. In that weekend, uh, we were all dealing with that, because that could have been a very unstable situation. At the same time, the, we found out that the Russians were trying to make a shortcut directly with the president of Moldova without consulting the five plus two. They were conducting their own negotiations. Well, whereas we were looking at Georgia, they were dealing with this at the same time. Uh -huh. And we found out uh, after that weekend on the Monday afternoon that they, uh, they wanted to force the issue and actually the, the advance party of President Putin had already arrived to, uh, to single-handedly deal with this and put a lot of pressure on the then president of Moldova. We found out, and we did support that. We said, you cannot have the Russian military presence in Moldova. There's a huge Russian military presence in, in Transnistria. Yep. And to 
changed them into blue helmets. That's mm -hmm. what they wanted to do. That's not acceptable to us because they, then it won't change anything, but we will basically legalize the whole situation. And then what happened? And well, basically we, uh, we, we said, you, you, we will not support you. And then the president of Moldova was afraid to be left alone without support of the European Union and NATO, because NATO also rejected it. And uh, at that moment, so uh, the, the president of Russia had to uh, call off his, uh, his triumphant arrival in, uh, in Kisinau, which was not nice uh, for him. So he lost faith. Yeah, but that was unavoidable because he tried to force the issue. And uh, so we, we were not, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't make him lo lose face because we didn't take the decision. It was the president of Moldo Moldova, he didn't want to do it. So basically he lost face vis-a-vis -vis the president of Moldova. And the price is very high. Lots of sanctions, economic sanctions against this poor country. And uh, so we are still, we are still there. And um, so those are sometimes very complex issues. Yeah. But uh, a lot of countries, now coming back to the war in Ukraine today, um, a lot of countries have also chosen to remain neutral despite EU lobbying attempts, despite attempts to um, have an international response. For example, uh, Brazilian President Lula or Colombian President Gustavo Petro have recently spoken a lot about um, the history of NATO member interventions in, in Latin America, for example, um, specifically the US. And so how, what is your interpretation of that and how do you think that, um, what consequences that has for an international response to the war? Well, it's difficult to say because every, every country has its own reasons. And we know that uh, Brazil, for instance, has a long history of non-aligned positions. So they don't want to take position in favor of one or another. Um, that's a long history. Uh, and, uh, well, it's in, in this specific case, obviously, we are continuing to, we try to convince that um, what uh, the Russian Federation is doing waging war against another country by taking over parts of its territory and terrorizing its, uh, its people, um, that this is in flagrant contradiction with the Charter of the United Nations, which basically says you can, you can never do this by force. Um, so we continue to make the point that this is uh, what we call all other countries, including countries like Brazil and India, to take their responsibility. And above all, China. Yeah. Because the only country that we think really has influence in trying to solve or persuade uh, the, the, Russian Federation. the Kremlin to, to, to change its uh, policies is probably China. But they have other reasons to be at least reluctant to do that. Yeah. They're not openly supporting it all the way, but they are ambivalent. And uh, well, this is also part of the, of the reality that we see, uh, I wouldn't say immediately a new Iron Curtain, but there is obviously a very complicated situation right now. And we have um, democracies, let's say North America, Europe, and others like Japan and, uh, and Korea. Um, we have authoritarian regimes uh, like uh, China and uh, uh, others, Russia. Uh, and we have then what they call the Global South. The Global South is also divided, right? You have a country like Brazil and India who uh, are not always on the same line and who take a little bit more distance. So part of the diplomatic work is trying to convince uh, countries that are hesitant that it's also in their interest to follow mm -hmm. the, the common rules. But then, of course, many of those countries say, well, yes, but the United Nations Charter was made in a period just after the war. Many of the countries yeah. did not even exist because of the decolonization later. So, uh, and China tries to play in that with the BRICS organization, with the Shanghai Cooperation Council, with numerous other Belt alternatives. And Road. Sorry? Yeah. Belt and Road. Belt and Road. So uh, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, maybe we can take some audience questions now. Yes, yes. Um, Raise your hand if you have a question, then the microphone will come to you. You were very fast, you're the first. And there's the microphone. Your question. Go ahead. 
I hope you can hear me. Oh. Yes. Okay. Um, so my question basically is, um, there has been very recent development between Canada and India, and I'm sure you must be following it. Uh, Canadian-born citizen were killed in Canada, and then afterwards, Canadian Prime Minister came in the parliament and accused India that they sort of assisted monetarily and otherwise uh, in carrying out the killing of that person. So my question is that how unusual, or if it is unusual, that a prime minister of a country uh, comes in parliament and alleges or accuses the other country of something, and especially when those two countries are not on that bad terms, uh, let's say they are not arch rivals, so to speak. Like, what's the tipping point? When do you feel, like in diplomatic circles, now it is the time that the prime minister or president should come at a public fora and address the issue? Like, a following up question can be like, how does the intelligence sharing between two countries work? And so, yeah. Well, I, I know as much as you, both from what I've read in the newspaper, so I don't have any inside information, obviously, because you now it's uh, a different uh, story. But uh, the, the general uh, habit in those circumstances is that there are discrete uh, discussions or consultations between in, no, any two countries where you have such a situation uh, without going public. So. I don't know what the reasons for the um, Prime Minister of Canada were to go public. I have no idea. But um, I think that is unusual. Um, I think in those situations you would first try to talk in a more discreet way. Maybe they have done that and it didn't lead to anything. I don't know. I'm speculating here. Maybe to build on your question, if you were ambassador, let's say, huh, in, in uh, uh, Turkey at the time, and you had credible sources that a uh, an civilian of uh, the Netherlands was killed in the Netherlands by, by Turkey, for example, what are then the steps you take uh, before you ask the prime minister to go to parliament and, and accuse a country? Like, are we talking about the process of months, of years? Because it seems so severe. I think that's also what you mean, eh? it's, yeah. it's the last resort, so to say. Well, that's why I don't know. I don't know what happened before, right? The, uh, yeah. They just met for the G20 in Delhi, so uh, it appeared to shaking hands and la smiling, so mm. I don't know why, why it all of a sudden um, turned uh, bad. No, I, 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 I frankly don't know. If that situation would occur, obviously we would try to under analyze, understand what's going on. Is this true? Do we have credible sources? You have to be very, very sure Mm. about, and you have to have proof, yeah. or at least very strong indications. And uh, uh, so you, you first try to, uh, to go to this through diplomatic and other and intelligence channels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before, so every because, other option. Because if you go public, there's no way back. Okay. That's the problem. Yeah. But sometimes there may be situations where you have to go public. For instance, if uh, independent journalists have found out, and they are publishing it, then yeah. uh, governments are, are forced to react. Okay. So, so this is complicated. There's no, there's no rule book for this. No, unprecedented. Very, relatively unprecedented, certainly between democracies. Yeah, yeah, also good to note. Next question, I think you were the first one I saw, yes? Go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the very insightful discussion until now. Um, we already touched upon the war in Ukraine multiple times, and people argued that um, in this case now that was the end of diplomacy. So my question is if... What is the power of diplomacy in those difficult situations when people actually prefer to let weapons speak instead of words? Um, first, in the case of war, and secondly, maybe also in cases in which a party prefer, prefers to uh, keep the status quo um, in diplomatic negotiations. Um, good question. Um, well. Diplomacy uh, can be conducted as long as people don't fight. It's a very simple rule. 
Once uh, you go over that border and you transgress that, uh, that line and you attack another country or you use force, then you don't talk anymore. Although you may try, but it makes no sense to talk if at the same time uh, dozens and hundreds and thousands of people are killed in, in acts of aggression and gross violations of human rights, by the way. It's all together. So um, then diplomacy is uh, basically losing, um, which is, of course, terrible because it's the only... You always have to come back to diplomacy in the end because if you use force and you use massive weapons systems against each other, there will be a moment that, uh, you know, it's over. You, 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 that you don't produce enough weapons or you have lost so many people in battle that you, have, you are forced to start talking again. And the problem is that we don't know when that will happen. Um, uh, so this is a, uh, a, a very dramatic situation. Now, at the same time, you may have noticed that uh, although a, a full war is going on now, there are, uh, here and there you get little indications that there are some talks. Uh, for instance, uh, the grain deal uh, that was brokered with the help of President Erdogan mm. played a very positive role in brokering this grain deal, also on behalf of poor countries. Um, now it's been revoked, but that was, that's an example that in a complicated war you can still talk on specific issues. And the other example is that the, the head of the two intelligence services of the United States and Russia also have met a couple of times. Basically also about signaling, um, don't use this, for instance, the nuclear threat, or don't do this because that will be a real red line for us. Mm. But that's not negotiating about a solution either. This is more like, you know, let's try to control that even worse things would happen. So we are, we are in a situation that, sadly, I have to say that diplomacy is on a holiday, a long holiday, and we, we, cannot, we cannot just come back to it. Uh, so we have to, to wait until we get a better chance there. Okay, last question. You did something very smart. You, you did this before I asked, so there you go. <laughs> um, can I? Yeah, go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, first of all, really insightful session. Uh, my name is Ramisha Ali and I'm part of the Monday's Journalism Program. Um, like you already mentioned that uh, when you were a diplomat and you were talking to, like you were um, negotiating with someone, it's not generally preferred to push someone in the corner. So as a person, what skills did you need to adopt to become a good diplomat? Because um, different societies are different in terms of context. Like I come from Pakistan and it's a very high context society. We are generally very diplomatic, you know, we never come to the point. But coming here, I feel like uh, Dutch society is quite low context. People are very to the point and direct. So, but a diplomat needs to be, you know, um, like very, very diplomatic. So <laughs> how did you adopt those skills first? The second question is, there was a recent case where a Pakistani was tried in uh, absentia. His name is Khalid Latif, and uh, it was on behalf of a Dutch politician, Geert Wilders. So um, what happens in that uh, case? Because Pakistan and Netherlands do not have an extradition treaty. So what do you do in such cases? Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good question. Uh, the, the, the first question um, about diplomacy. Uh, well, first of all, um, as a diplomat, you will always deal with other countries, other cultures. So, the starting rule, rule number one is, and this sounds like kicking in an open door, foreigners are different. Don't assume that people are like you, because you have the same academic background or right, whatever. Foreigners are different. And obviously, there are huge differences between Pakistan and the Netherlands, for instance, but there are also huge differences between Belgium and the Netherlands, or Germany and the Netherlands. And too often, we think they're like us, but they're not. So you have to start saying they are different. Second thing, you have to understand when you get into a negotiation or you get into a discussion about a certain subject with uh, representatives of another government, that um, 
you have to understand their motives. They may take a position that is not the position you want. You want a different outcome. But it's much more, much more useful, in my experience, to uh, go into and understand the motivations and the backgrounds of the positions your opposite number takes than to try to force down the throat your own position. Because if you do that strictly according to your remit or the, 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 the instructions you get, you'll get nowhere. You bump into a wall. So it's very important to understand motives and backgrounds of others and try to create a kind of common problem and then try to find a solution. That means you have to find compromises. That's rule number three. You always have to look for the compromise. Forcing something never works. Because even if it works at the short term, the things will come back at a later stage and then you are nowhere. So you try to solve it in a more profound way. And uh, another thing is that uh, you have to, as much as possible, uh, learn foreign languages. Now, I don't speak Urdu, but uh, the English that I speak is also very different English from English Pakistan speaks, because you may use the same words, but there are other meanings behind those words. I've so often been in situations uh, in Asia, for instance, where you take a certain position and you, you say, do you agree? And the person in question says, yes. But yes doesn't mean I agree very often. It means I acknowledge you said something or, you know, mm. or you have cultures where people never say no. They say only yes or like in Greece. When do, in Greece, it's very interesting. If you, 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 you don't want to upset your opposite number by saying no, so you do it like this. It means no. It doesn't mean yes, right? Because you don't do like this. So these also the non-verbal communication is very important. That's what I learned in Greece. Um, and in many other countries, this, there are specific situations where you are. So diplomacy is not about being only flexible and only giving in. That's not diplomatic. Very often has a sort of negative connotation that you know people, they are a little bit uh, going in all directions and they go with all the winds. This is not true. But uh, in, in, very s in very small negotiations with just a few people, you can be extremely tough. But then in such a way that the loss of face with two or three people around the table is not the same thing as loss of face before an entire room. And that is what you have to avoid. But there may be a situation where you really have to push very much. Um, and then you, you try to do that in uh, more private uh, you know, sort of uh, corridors uh, outside a formal negotiation. So those are a few things that are, I think, important. And the last thing I would say about successful diplomacy, that if really you can't find a common solution, then you try to enlarge the context. You try to put other elements in the negotiation, thereby diluting a little bit the specific contradiction you have by creating a larger issue. Um, there's one extremely successful example for that, if I may, for just one sentence. Um, the uh, European Union, when it started, was done, it was successful, because in the impossible negotiation between France and Germany after 1945 about who was owning what and how we're going to avoid that ever again a new war can break out between those two countries. There was a complete stalemate in the late 40s about who would control the coal and steel, uh, basically the, to prepare for war, cannons. Uh, and what did they do? They created a community, a high authority, above those two countries dealing with coal and steel. And that's the origin, it's the coal, European coal and steel community, which is the origin of the current European Union. So you enlarge the context to solve something specific which is not possible to solve. <laughs> so that's an example, a very good example, but there are other examples. That's very interesting. I think there's a couple of other situations we want to discuss with you, but thank you for that question. Um, let's set the scene for your first ambassadorship, because your first ambassadorship was in 2008 in Greece, and you arrive, and a couple of days later, uh, Wall Street collapses and the financial crisis sweeps the EU. So what were you thinking at that moment? What was your first reaction? Well, 
Greece is a, uh, a member of the European Union. It's, and was at that time, a member of the Eurozone. It was a member of Schengen, a member of NATO, so it was a member of everything. Uh, really the core of European cooperation. And when then at a certain stage, for reasons I won't go into here, the markets collapse and the Greek economy collapses because they cannot pay their debts anymore. Uh, for the, I'm not going to the reasons here, but we, we all read the newspapers. You have a very serious situation because in a monetary union, you cannot devalue. You cannot, like Argentina did, for instance, or countries that have a trust, you can do, devalue your currency to try to, uh, to, to win time and to go into a number of uh, more profound and uh, restructuring of, uh, of and, and uh, uh, basically try to, to, to solve some of those deeper issues. In uh, Greece, this was not possible because you joined uh, the uh, monetary policy with others. So these were uncharted waters in the beginning, 2009, 2010, when it started. Um, so there are no rule books for that. Because in a monetary union, you know, nobody has ever experienced this. So we were all trying to, to find our way without knowing exactly where this would end. But the Netherlands was also not the most popular we were very country tough. to represent. We were very tough because we are very orthodox, uh, Calvinistic. Uh, you, if you have debts, you have to pay your debts. Well, I won't go into issues like the, the word schuld, which means debt, but it also means moral debt mm. in Dutch. It's a very relig religious uh, word at the same time. So, uh, but that's not the case in, uh, in Greece. And um, uh, so... What we basically, uh, we, we were extremely tough as a government on the debt issue. And we created these huge funds together with other European countries to create buffers that this would never happen again. But at the same time, we also said we have to help Greece to do proper reforms. So we were very tough and not always easy with the Greeks on the debt issue, on the, on the budget issues. So you cannot spend more than you receive, basically, or a little bit more, but not much. Uh, at the same time, we help them with reforms, reforms of the uh, Chamber of Accounts, mm -hmm. uh, the Rekenkamer, as we would call it in Dutch, with the uh, tax office, with the uh, land registration, with uh, a number of other areas where we try to play a positive role. And, and in the end, you try to find a balance. We are tough as nails on this issue, but we, we, we don't refrain from our responsibility to offer our help on those other areas. And that basically worked out quite well in it the worked. end. Yeah, Greece has gone from 206% debt on GDP to 117% now. Yeah. So I guess we could count this as one of your... Positive. It's still pretty high, and the deep reforms are, are still going on, and mm -hmm. uh, we are not yet completely there, because the ultimate analysis is that countries like Greece are not sufficiently competitive. They import uh, too many of the consumer goods and produce too little. They ba they're very dependent on tourism and shipping, for instance, mm -hmm. and a few other areas, but in, so insufficient uh, competi competitivity. And so to make Greece a more competitive country is where we try to help them. And not only us, but also other countries. So then maybe we can touch on another very interesting ambassadorship you had in Turkey. Um, on the 13th of March, 2017, the front page of the NOS read, Turkey blocks Dutch ambassador from entering. That doesn't happen very often. Why did it happen? Well, um, the, um, there was an attempt for a coup d'etat in uh, July, 14, 15, 15, 16 July, 2016, in Ankara and Istanbul. It failed. Uh, so President Erdogan basically uh, made arrests, you know, all the, the coup. Uh, people who were behind the coup and all that. Then he said, this can never happen again. We should change the constitution into a presidential system. 
because there was a sort of more ceremonial presidency in his time. He wanted to be a more executive president like the United States or French presidents are, right? Mm -hmm. So, but for that, it's a long story, but for that he needed to have a referendum because he didn't have, he, could, he couldn't do it through parliament. He didn't have enough votes. He needed a referendum. Now, about half the population of Turkey traditionally votes for the party of the president, the AKP of Erdogan, and the other half votes on other parties, mainly a little bit more center-left parties, the old Kemalist party, uh, Kemal Atatürk. Uh, and, uh, but it's 50-50, more or less. So you need to win with uh, 50 point something. Uh, Erdogan said, in order to win this referendum, I have to get the help from all those uh, people with Turkish voting rights who live outside of Turkey. Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, Belgium, Scandinavian countries. With large communities of citizens, in our case Dutch citizens, but with a Turkish background, who very often have double nationality and have voting rights in Turkey. And very often, uh, people with that background, they come from areas that traditionally vote for the party of President Erdogan. So more people would vote for him in the Netherlands or in Germany or in other countries than actually in Turkey itself. Yeah. And that can make the difference just the 50.2, 50.3, 50.1 uh, percent, right, to, to win this uh, referendum. So he sent ministers, representatives, members of parliament to our countries to talk to the communities with a Turkish background and also to the Netherlands. And uh, at one stage in March 2017, the, um, the foreign minister of Turkey wanted to come and speak to Turkish citizens in the Netherlands. And the, uh, the, the minister, foreign affairs ministers and the, the, the prime minister of the Netherlands did not want that. They did not want to have a, a political manifestation of a other country in our country in the open space. So what was offered was you can have a meeting inside your embassy, but not in the Maliveld or not in the center of town with, with, with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. It's, it's not, this has nothing to do with the Netherlands. It's your issue in Turkey, right? And uh, well, that came to a clash uh, when the foreign minister was refused landing rights in the Netherlands on that famous Saturday and so he was refused entry. And then later in the day, another minister who was in, in Germany crossed the border and tried to get into the center of Rotterdam and was stopped by the, the police and the mayor of Rotterdam. And later in that evening, sent back to the border with Germany as and an uninvited guest. And, and you were in And Turkey, I happened yeah. to be here just for from private uh, a few days. You know, sometimes you have to go back to do some things. And uh, I was then um, refused uh, re-entry. They never condemned me uh, or gave me the status of a persona non grata, because that would be more serious. But they said Ambassador Van Rey should not return for a while. Well, the while took 11 months. And in the meantime, uh, the Netherlands uh, government never wanted to withdraw me, because they said there's nothing wrong with Ambassador Van Rey. So you uh, have a home, you are so I was, I was, there, uh, I was uh, running the embassy in a pre-COVID period with Zoom every day. <laughs> so I was an expert when uh, COVID broke loose. Uh, I knew exactly how to deal with uh, Zoom mis missions and Zoom sessions. Uh, but that's what, what happened. And then after 11 months, uh, we were not able to find a solution because the Turkish government wanted to have apologies from the Dutch government for what they did in Rotterdam. And obviously the Dutch government said, well, it's you that should present uh, apologies, not us. Well, we never solved it. And um, in the end, uh, the, the minister withdrew me and then appointed me to Brazil. That's how things go sometimes. It's very rare, this kind of thing, as you pointed out, it's very rare, in particular between two NATO members, because yeah. Turkey and the Netherlands yeah. are NATO yeah. members. So it's very strange. On okay. the same side, you would it, say. It, yeah. it, it, it happened. It happened. Yeah. Well, I so, think it all, so in other words, it means that very often ambassadors and diplomats have a kind of uh, uh, aura of uh, people who deal only with uh, in receptions and they're drinking a glass of champagne and they have a good life. Well, uh, obviously uh, you have to meet people, so you meet people in cocktail parties and dinners. It's part of the work. 
but very uh, nasty things can happen too. So uh, in particular, when you have this kind of uh, clash, then it's merciless because the relationships between countries, let's say it's a very thin varnish uh, of civility and of, uh, let's say, good behavior that covers relations between countries. But beneath that, there is raw power very often. Wow. That's a great point to start closing up the interview. Um, but you mentioned a couple of qualities of a great diplomat in one of your answers in the audience questions. And um, I guess we'd want to know, would you say you've lived up to the, your own criteria? Um, I hope. I hope. I was, I've been in my professional career of 40 years, almost 40 years, that I've been a good diplomat, that I've helped my country, that I served the, let's say, the, the basic values and interests of my country. That's what I, that's what I tried. Um, and at the same time, um, for about 10 years, I worked, of course, in the European Union. Uh, then, you know, you're part of a bigger, a bigger situation. Um, Sometimes uh, with success, sometimes with failures, like the crisis with Turkey was a failure. Uh, not to say that anybody has a specific, uh, you know, is, can be blamed for that because things mm -hmm. happen. But uh, most of the time, I think, um, you know, what you try to do is bring people together, solve issues, uh, enrich cooperation, um, something, for instance, uh, Cooperation between universities is something that I've always tried in all the places where I was. Uh, because I believe strongly that if uh, young students or scholars or researchers work together, it's better. It's better for the overall climate to get to know each other and solve common issues. Uh, so it's not only governments. Of course, most of the time you deal with relations between governments, but also with, with, with the relationship between citizens. And I think um, uh, I would s strongly hope that you know, many of the people that are here, um, I don't know what your professional ambitions are, but I would very much recommend and hope that some of you will work for, for, go for the government, for government costs or governmental positions um, to create, well, what we call common, it's a very common word to say, but to create a better world. And that also deals with, obviously with issues like migration, the climate challenges, you know, the general environment in which we live. Uh, we would like to have a, a, a civil and, and more a kinder world, in a way, no? So that's in the end what you do it for, without being overly uh, uh, idealistic, of course. You have to be a realist as well. But that's very important. So I hope uh, my, some of my experiences will have helped some of you <laughs> to understand a little bit about this uh, strange métier. Yeah, I think we definitely got some stories we wouldn't heard, have heard from anywhere else today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, interviews coming up. Among them, uh, Mr. Pols, he is the director of Milieu Defensie. He will join us here to discuss, for example, the lawsuits against uh, the Dutch state. So it should be very interesting. Uh, you can find more info on our website uh, about that. Uh, Mr. Fry, thank you very much for being here today. We enjoyed your company immensely. And um, yeah, all there is left for me to do is uh, ask you for a big round of applause for Kees van Rijn. <laughs>